Attention Dunwall citizens, the assassin Corvo, responsible for the murder of our fair empress and the disappearance of Lady Emily, heir to the throne, has temporarily escaped state custody. Games developed by Arcane Studios respected for brilliant art direction and holistic level design. Today we will talk about Original Dishonored, one of the brightest immersive sims in industry. We will discuss all elements of the game and try to determine their influence on player experience. Our special emphasis would be dedicated to art direction, to understand how it affects development process and final result. For what purpose devs concentrate huge resources working on unique artistic vision, and where do they draw inspiration from? I welcome you to Iconic Game Design, the series about design secrets of legendary projects. So let's try to figure out together how did they achieve such success. Let's dive deep into their game design. So put on your mask and blink to the top ledge. From there, our watch begins. But before we examine art direction, let's briefly talk about core gameplay. In fact, Dishonored encouraged two opposite playstyles, and first is stealthy-based immersive sim. Here we hide in shadows, try not to get inside, and strive to achieve our goals with minimal casualties. By choosing this path, player imposes a number of limitations on his playstyle, but the game is ready to reward his efforts in return. It provides a clear feedback, starting from messages of loudspeakers, number of rats and patrols on the streets, appearance of infected citizens and dialogue with NPCs. At the same time, this way of playing is relatively slow and thoughtful. But it doesn't turn into a permanent crawling in the shadows, player always under pressure, while he got necessary time to think on his next steps. However, this playstyle is full of exaggerations. Having stunned guard and hide his unconscious body in a quiet corner, his comrades didn't notice anything and our opponent will slip tight until the end of the mission, no matter how long our adventure lasts. In case of Dishonored, we can make sure that it is not necessary to make a game as realistic as possible, but it is necessary to make game exciting and fun for the player. The key here is the tension feeling, player need to explore level and carefully plan his intrusion to remain unseen. So to balance this tension, we provided by useful mechanics and feedback systems, such as X-ray vision, clear sound effects, keyhole picking and others. These tools help player to control game scene, so if he desire to take a risk or be more cautious, it is completely by him. And stealth playstyle is not the only way, we can choose a completely different path, the path of violence. Our protagonist becomes a master assassin who can eliminate opponents in a blink of an eye, if you dig deeper, this is a completely different game that provokes you to use mechanics, level design and enemies themselves in much violent way. Well, where else you will got the opportunity to stagger enemy by throwing severed head of his comrade? Where else you can blow brains out of your opponent with his own bullet? Here, the combat system thrives. Now we are juggling an arsenal of deadly weapons, performing a magnificent dance. Just check out this fight. The richness of Corvus arsenal reveals boundless experimentation field. Each weapon fits for specific situation. You can discreetly kill the enemy with a crossbow bolt or throw a grenade in the midst of enemies. Here the game level as a canvas, weapons is a paint and brushes are precise controls driven by player's hand. Through this you can draw your own bloody painting. There are at least two emotional states of the player that can be triggered by this playstyle. And first is a bloodlust, like in good old Quake. You just crush everyone on your path. You flew around the level with a tremendous speed and all you care about is searching for a next victim. To reach this state you should provide player with necessary combat speed and pacing. He should drown in this bloodbath. Destruction and slowdowns are unacceptable here. Alternative emotional state is an inspiration by directing an entire combat scene. Like a choreographer, player can set all characters to perform a spectacular performance. A great violent dance during these dark times. For this, you need to give him variety of weapons, abilities and moves. And by variety here, I mean radically different game mechanics, encouraging experimentations. So each combat scene become a toy in itself. It is really amazing. 
But in fact, there are some controversial elements in Dishonored gameplay. First is the stealth mechanics. It is too simple in terms of game design and trivial in terms of experience. For example, the Thief series got much complicated and balanced stealth mechanics. Nevertheless, in Dishonored, stealth is implemented this way for a wider audience coverage, for casual players. There is no doubt that this system could be more comprehensive at higher difficulty modes. But balancing this will require a lot more resources. And second claim is artificial intelligence. It really spoils the gameplay, especially when you get into direct fight, enemies just trying to chase you by shortest calculated path, occasionally shooting in your direction. Same with stealth, when guards try to track you down, it's just ridiculous. Higher difficulty modes change a little, so this adjustment is the third and perhaps final major weak spot of the project. You're just much easier to detect and you got less HP. You don't need to get good and master new techniques, you just need to be more cautious and react quicker. Now let's move to art direction, a fundamental discipline that consists of many different design elements. And to consider all of them, we will start with the background of Dunwall. Initially Arcane wanted to take medieval Japan setting for this project, but due to insufficient knowledge of this era and alleged difficulties in upcoming marketing, it was decided to change it to London during a Great Plague period. First, a general vision of the setting was formed, so to work out it in details, Viktor Antonov and Sebastian Meaden, who were responsible for visual design and art direction, went to Albion. They visited London and Edinburgh in search of inspiration. Appearances of streets, architectural features of buildings, panoramic views, pop interiors, exhibits of local museums and even people's facial expressions. Their task was to get the spirit of these places and try to recreate an image of plague corruption several centuries earlier, to immerse city in the exact setting they wanted. During this journey, they tried to build their routes through narrow sideway streets, where are no tourists, so they could plunge into true lifestyle of the city. The architecture of an old streets resembling gloomy canyons was borrowed, that perfectly fits verticality and variability of gameplay. All this was decorated well, with the peculiarity of facades, guardhouses, warning signs and other smaller strokes, which are specific for this place. But artists didn't copy any feature blindly. Every detail gained its own unique form, and more this world took details, the more it became obvious that this image is not like London, Edinburgh or any other city. It is Dunwall. As you can see, Arcane have managed to form a unique vision of their world. But why all these efforts? The answer is pretty simple. It's all about human perception and memory. Entire city in each detail, even if it has a prototype in real world, is a great way to arouse the player's attention to extraordinary features. Arcane don't want to use a photorealistic approach in visual style. And here is a reason. By creating an unseen images and forms of familiar objects, we activate player curiosity urge. We open his mind for exploration. In contrast, by presenting a real-looking world, we unintentionally suppress imagination, so player analyzing game scene for compliance with reality, which is a completely different reaction. And same happened with our memory, that will rather keep unique aesthetic experience instead of realistic one. But Arcane is a large company, and how do you convey all these ideas without any loss to artists, designers, animators and others who involved in the process? First, the vision must be constrained by the major pillars, which is fundamental to the project. It is only an assumption, but I'll try to define the base for few of these pillars. Definitely it is London, plague, verticality, contrast, mysticism and quickness. And you should come up with your list in comments. Every system element must fit and match these pillars, and anything that doesn't must be redesigned or discarded. This is an optimal and necessary measure for any project because during development you always want to implement new ideas that come to mind. And maybe it all great, but if it doesn't meet the general concept of the game, it should be excluded. And second approach, you need to choose a single person, a visioneer. The one who will be responsible for the completeness of this vision as a whole picture and will collect a mosaic of design puzzles in a consistent game. It is called art direction for a reason. You should always maintain and secure this direction. Here's a good example of using the prism of these design pillars for a game world decoration. Sebastian Meaton, when visiting office in Austin, noticed a guy on stilts washing the building facade. 
This was a memorable picture, and he suggests to Harvey Smith the idea to put down Wall City Crier on stilts, to give him recognizable detail. They agreed, but later Tim was asked to replace the City Criers with loudspeakers, which amplified the atmosphere of quarantine during plague and were certainly a great finding. The Criers were out of business, but their image was bright and memorable, so devs decided to transform them into a peculiar tall boys on bizarre stilts, armed with the crossbows. Later, to enhance this image, there was an idea of placing tank of phosphorus on their back, to get a nice visual effects when they shoot, and Harvey proposed one small modification, let it be whale oil instead of phosphorus. And this little detail received an unexpected continuation. It was said that the whale oil would be used as a main power source for all devices working on electricity. And since this is the only suitable source of energy, the whale fishing becomes one of the most important industry in Dunwall. Unique whaling ships, shipyards, oil factories were designed, and even whales themselves was transformed. Amulets and runes that have mystical effects were produced from their bones. As a result, images of whales and whalers become a part of Dishonored visual style and gave the game its special charm. Isn't that magic? The landscapes and backgrounds of Dawnwall fits vision as well, worked out exactly to extend that the player can feel the scale of this world. They also link various locations together, creating a sense of integrity. The goal of these backgrounds is to save player from claustrophobia and to mask level boundaries. Such details encourage player to explore the world, searching in evident details around which you can build lore, speculations and mysteries. And now it's time to talk about design of Dishonored characters. Developers was inspired by the works of different artists to create images of Dunwall and its characters. They use as a references photos of people they took in London and Edinburgh. They wanted to create recognizable characters, and the keywords here are legibility and contrast. Remember those pillars? Yeah, right. The appearance of Dunwall citizens emphasized their differences. Arcane even hired an anatomy expert who helped to ensure that the morphology of character faces embrace British features. The graceful and delicate figures of the upper classes tells us that they have never performed physical work, they are visually fragile, but the expression on their faces speaks of their strong trait, intriguer, cunning and cruelty are reflected in their eyes, they treat people like a trash. Next, the military, with a straight posture and disproportionately large fists, representative of brute force and will of government, image of the militaristic order. People who are supposed to serve and protect, but they force to suppress civilian revolts. Carfew, alert system and patrols on the street are not just quarantine measures, they are martial law. Lower class here are isolated and exterminated. Common civilians who die hundreds from the plague, who have no protection. Due to all these details, player doesn't need explanations. You can tell him story through visual images. He is free to make personal opinion about Dunwall and its people. Here, Devs gives us a very valuable resource – freedom of judgment. Even images of our allies, whether it's Admiral Havelock, an experienced officer who sent soldiers on suicide missions by hundreds, or Lord Pendleton, a quirky politician who often takes a nervous sip from his whiskey flask. All their features are gradually revealed as a storyline progress. It is brilliant narration technique that makes this story alive. Moreover, we should note that all personalities and events are represented through conflicts. This is either a conflict of opposing factions that pursue their own goals, a struggle for survival in a world filled with a plague, or a duty contradiction. It's a real heroes and martyrs with their own story. Also, we got personal conflicts. Our character Corvo got own motives. He wants revenge and not interested in internecine strife and even a conflict of intelligence vividly presented in the game by the competition of greatest minds, Pira Joplin and Anton Sokolov, through highlighting the difference in the research methods and accomplishments. Without all these conflicts, characters and storyline will become flat. This approach saturates any narrative design with the bright colors. But the game is not a book, and in addition to rich personalities and plot twists, the scene need to be animated. Here our silent hero get his moves. Thanks to the animators we feel like our agile assassin descends climbing to ledges like a cat and jumping through level at lighting speed. Here it is all dedicated to player eyes. We constantly see both hands and receiving feedback from any weapon or ability we use. 
Also, when switching from running to stealth, Corvo changed his stance that telegraphs his state. Even detailed animation of heavy fall does its work. For many projects, such details are excessive, but here all this performed to provide feedback and create an immersive effect. Same approach we see in combat scenes. Visually, fights are implemented just fantastically. Enemy dodge attack, shoot, performing sword clinches, but Corvo strikes faster. Again, animation helps. The variability of finisher moves makes each fight unique only because of visuals. This, as well as the right combat pacing, is more than enough to plunge player into a combat trance. But to enhance the immersion effect, we provide it with very delicious detail. The mask that Koro takes off returning to the pub and puts on starting the next chapter of his adventure. This detail is not required for any game system, but it reveals the Arcane Studio distinctive feature. Do the work on 100% and after at icing on cake. This is what divides a good project from a brilliant one. But the visuals is only part of the art direction. Sound design also plays an important role. Unfortunately, in most cases the work of composers and sound designers remains without praise. It is not difficult to notice rudeness in sound design. But often, when everything works perfectly, player just didn't notice it. There are exceptions, of course, but we should list unique elements of Dishonored sound design, such as ambient based on the rhythm of industrial city, or dynamic changes in musical theme depending on gameplay and context. Sound effects of the world, which feel alive, not synthesize it, because it constantly reminds the player that there are living processes in it. Life doesn't stop for a minute. All these details is implemented perfectly, but one I would like to dive in more detail, the voice acting. Devs have assembled a stellar team of voice actors. They got movie celebrities, including Michael Madsen, Lena Headey, Susan Sarandon and cutest Chloe Grace Moretz, along with the real masters of voicing from gaming industry. This team has done truly titanic work and they definitely have something to be proud of. All this was done to provide and enhance the character's versatility, so they could evoke our emotions and we can easily plunge ourselves into colorful stories of Don Wall. From here, I would like to talk about equally important fundamental elements of art direction, such as color palettes, fonts and interface design. Often, the artist's work begins with the choice of color palette, and game design is no exception. This choice is very important for the shaping of the spirit that the game world should convey. In our case, the color should primarily emphasize the setting and provide the atmosphere of decay and hopelessness of Great Plague, so color combination in Dishonored perfectly cope with this. But do we need to limit the palette to meet only one design goal? By adding new color combinations at the right moments, game designer can present a new idea or specific mood that he wants to highlight at the time. As an example, we got the ball in Boil Estate. In the world of desperation, you find yourself in a mansion with a cheek interior and richness in every detail. Color palette here differs from what we've seen earlier and emphasizes luxury. Pathos and excess rule here. See how all this corresponds to audience. We do not know these masked people, but we become sure that they are far from the problems of Dawnwall and have never seen the backstreets of working-class neighborhoods. Mind-blowing delicacies served, while the whole city is starving. Here, the colors carefully underlined all these details and evoke right emotions. Same as with the artist's work on a painting, colors might serve as a foundation of art direction. And finally, devs need to solve one but very important task – provide the connection between player and the game. It often happens that little attention is paid to work on the user interface as a piece of art. But this is one of the most important elements of the game. It is clear that the more intuitive interaction scenario is, the shorter the player path to gameplay, the faster he can enjoy the process without long setups and adjusting controls. Above all that, here all menus are not only perfectly readable and well-structured, but also beautifully animated. Interface lives and interacts with us in its own way. Tables and directories work in the real world, when it's all about business, but they have no place in games, at least they shouldn't. And the primary way of communication in most of these interaction scenarios goes through text, so font choices plays an important utility and aesthetic role. Font styles should match an art direction. And let's put Dishonored aside and look how it works in other legendary projects, where recognizable fonts design it for the same purposes. You are familiar with these examples. Doom, Fallout, Diablo, Half-Life. These fonts individually become iconic and directly associate with these game worlds. 
and player is paying back grateful for such attitude, because reading much easier rise visual images where only our imagination can render picture. So the font styles is inseparable element of art direction. Now let's sum up our survey about art direction of Dishonored. And finally question arises, why did Arcane so hardly trying to create something new, make their own fiction and art style? Why the team that certainly has enough resources to create realistic visuals decided to implement a vision that is deliberately grotesque and obtrusively angular in most game objects? Why in all interviews they repeat these words as a mantra, no photorealistic graphics? I think that in Dishonored, photorealistic approach may decrease or completely disable players' imagination involvement. I mean, yes, community always wants something that would work like a matrix, where you doubt whether it's reality or a game. But what players really need is not realism. They need fun experience. In attempts to implement everything looking as in real life, often the opposite effect occurs. Player begins to look for inconsistencies, pays attention to details that are absolutely not important and blames the game instead of dive himself in gameplay process. This is how our brain works. When it receives a signal that he faces a real-world simulation, it uses a logical cerebral hemisphere, begins to analyze, thereby disabling the imagination which involvement is in foundation of the gaming industry. We link ourselves with characters who want to explore an unknown world only because of that. Here's what Arcane tells us between the lines. Be extremely careful with photorealism or any other realism, this should be exactly the feature that strengthens the pillars of your project. Otherwise, photorealism can only harm. But we were distracted of trying to find the magic formula of the Dishonored art style. Downwall itself matched the setting and enhanced the pillar's impact in every smallest detail. Narrow streets with numerous paths, architecture of buildings, the interior of apartments and decor elements, although were inspired by London and Edinburgh, but being completely reimagined. The laws by which this world lives, from engineering to mythology, from political system to human struggle, are perfectly inscribed in the surrealism of this world. In other words, specific elements of the art direction are executed in such a way to complement and strengthen each other. All of them got certain design objectives, concluded within the framework of the original pillars of the artistic vision. And all the dev team need to do now is to add a bit of spice in this brilliant dish. So let's talk about the second remarkable feature of this project. Level design. The element on which Dishonored gameplay is based. There is no open world, but this variability of playstyle ways on each mission with their limited scale is shocking. Two teams worked in parallel. Level designers, whose main task was to design a structure of the level that will support such a complex gameplay. And architects, who were responsible for the aesthetic component and environmental design. Their joint goal was to create a level system that on the one hand gives player enough freedom and on the other doesn't confuse and lead the way gently, so he can intuitively explore location the way it planned by developers. There are always several paths how to reach the objective, but level are designed so that they have certain checkpoints, where possible paths are crossed. As you pass these, the ways might diverge again, this helping to optimize designing process and increasing variability of playthroughs. Because you have much more than 3 or 5 ways to reach the mission objective. You got few level sections and on each you provide player with options to choose their way and it's a great technique. Although this is guidance, not a complete freedom. We got many projects on market with an empty locations that offer to player frustrating non-working ways to play. Instead, you need to encourage him and provide with the proper navigation tools. A simple case doors here. Down wall streets filled with many doors, and player knows exactly whether a particular opens or not. You don't need to mindlessly break in each one. These are visual images which create clear feedback rules for level design. This approach is manifested in everything. You always got some landmarks, hints, it is hard to get lost here. Which path you choose, everywhere you will find something interesting as a reward for your curiosity. Designing such levels was a very difficult challenge for our game since our character got blink, double jump, mind control and other complex abilities. For applying all of this, you should implement level mazes accordingly. It is tremendous amount of work of game designers and playtesters. It is difficult to make any estimations how much resources need to be spent on testing such a complicated game systems. 
but in the end it was worth it. With all the complexity, missions are exciting, not overloaded with unnecessary details, have clear guidelines and every time you play a familiar level you might find something new. A good project should always offer opportunities for replayability. You need to convince player to return to this world. And Dishonored can provide both new content and new experience. This is rare nowadays. Now it is time to talk about narrative design. This project abounds with the various methods of storyline presentation. There are elements already familiar to us that working well and those that without exaggeration spoil the gameplay. Once that works good is the mission intros, atmospheric, hand-drawn styled with excellent voiceover. Next, the cutscenes performed on the game engine that introduced us to objectives at the beginning and summarize our adventure at the end of each episode. And finally, environmental storytelling that reveals the side stories of Dawnwall. You can find its elements in every flat. It is a great way to speak with the player through the core. But there are also techniques that work not so good. I'm talking about those in-game text notes and excerpts. I know that there are players who like to read once and get acquainted with the lore. But I think if you make an immersive stealth action, this element of narrative can spoil the flow of gameplay, knocks down its pace and player can lose intended mood. In both cases, whether you play in a ruthless assassin or sneaking around in the shadows trying to be harmless, I can't imagine really that the character takes a short pause and sits down on a creaking cot to read literally preferences of some beggar. That slow space of action and knocks down the tension level in which player meant to be. But to be completely honest, these text notes are not just graphomania. Often it is an exciting reading, and sometimes these small strokes took other unexpected forms. After all, text and sound is a good way of plot distribution. Take loudspeakers that notify residents about the city events, providing a variable messages that depends on players' actions. This system is a real gem. It has a few purposes. As an element of stylish decor, as an interactive game object that can be dropped on the enemies, and in addition, it is the way of narration perfectly fitted into the setting or audiographs, listening to which we can learn personal stories, motives and thoughts that help us to reveal characters more deeply. But even that is not all. Corvo got a unique tool in his arsenal, the mysterious heart that serves as a kind of compass for finding hidden treasures. This heart also can read minds and sometimes it can help make a right decision. Ambiguous metaphor fits here. Listen to your heart. Well, actually the heart of your beloved empress, but you got the point. So here we got an excessive number of tools for narrative distribution. And who knows, maybe some of this can be cut out. As for the main storyline content, it is rather weak spot of Dishonored narrative. It is mostly straightforward, without much frills. And maybe one good twist. Don't get me wrong, it is not bad. It only accompanies the gameplay, but nothing more. Side stories here are much more exciting, especially DLC ones. Forget about city trials, as it seems like the experiment mostly. The main storyline revealed on a different angle through the eyes of Daoud, whose voice role was perfectly performed by Michael Madsen. Dishonored DLCs expand the world with a new interesting twist that let you rethink the original story and make a connection with a future sequel to create an intrigue of upcoming events. Here we see flip side of the Empress murder, and that is amazing. That's how good DLC should work. And finally, to the essence of Dishonored game design. Let's look what we've got. Variety of gameplay, ranging from the choice of ideology, weapons, skills and gameplay scenes. Delightful level design and astonishing art direction. All aim to arouse player's imagination, to immerse him in this world and make this journey memorable. Again, player's imagination is a game designer's best friend. And the unique approach of Arcane Studio is that all development process are based on strong artistic vision. It is not the only possible way, you can organize dev process differently, based on theme, particular mechanic or technology, but it is their way. And the magic here is in the attitude to a project as to an artwork, this makes their projects unique.
This game design quest was pretty exciting and I hope you like it also, so feel free to express your thoughts about game design of Dishonored below and I will join you. And if you enjoyed this video, you know what to do. Thank you very much for watching, I see you soon, bye!